Good evening, folks. Welcome to the Stephen Leeson Show, live from the Scientology Community Centre here in Dublin. Our first guest this evening is a Tipperary man who spent his formative years living in the Schlieffalem Mountains, where tradition is diehard, where his father sang John McDermott songs and rebel ballads of the Tipperary area. Whilst his mother would quote reams of poetry by heart, Dick learned the old nationalistic ballad from attending the Christian Brothers where he studied their songbook. At 17 years of age, Dick moved to Dublin. There he met Brendan O'Dowd's father, or brother, sorry, Frank, who introduced him to Brendan's fan club, the Brendan O'Dowd Circle. Dick joined the club on a trip to Belfast where Brendan was doing a concert at the Grove Theatre. Since then, he's traveled all over Ireland in his quest of traditional Irish music and song. And in 1977, Dick produced his highly acclaimed album, Wonders of the World. The album itself displays Dick's character. Its complexity derives from a unique blend of musical arrangements given to each track by some of the most famous and accomplished traditional Irish musicians. The RT Concert Orchestra accompanied Dick on three of the tracks. It was described as a staggeringly brilliant collection by broadcaster and critic John O'Riga. Dick has toured many parts of the world, including the US, Russia, Europe, and South Africa. And his proudest moment was during an Australian tour when he sang, If We Only Had Old Ireland Over Here, to over 70,000 people at the Melbourne Cricket Grounds, their most hallowed stadium. His music is frequently played on BBC, RT Radio, and most local radio stations. And he appeared on RT television as a singer and a set dancer and even featured with his wife Bridget in the movies September and Scarlet. In July 2013, Dick launched the Hogan Collection, the largest and most varied collection of traditional songs ever recorded by an Irish singer, and it included a 300-page songbook. He's here with us tonight. Folks, that's welcome. Mr. Dick Hogan. Uh, good evening. So I'm going to sing some traditional songs for you now. And they won't be uh, the typical traditional songs that you might expect in that I won't be singing any long, sad songs or songs of battles, wars, misfortune, or anything like that. Because the traditional repertoire is far, far more extensive than that. Unfortunately, you don't hear much of this material on radio uh, or on records, and this has always annoyed me, I have to say. So I've always made a point of demonstrating to people that there is much more to traditional singing than people normally uh, think. So the first song I sing now is a little old comical song from Cork City, from the early part of uh, around the 1930s, called The Night the Goat Broke Loose on Grand Parade. <clears throat> well, Paddy McGinty bought a house and lived in Sunday's well, situated on the north side of the Lee. Well, he lived all alone in his cosy little home, so he bought a goat to keep him company. Well, says Paddy to the goat, for you I'll buy a coat, and a visit to Cork City we will pay. But the goat kicked up a mountain when he saw the very fountain on the night the goat broke loose on Grand Parade. Well, on the night the goat broke loose on Grand Parade, all the people of Cox City got afraid, and the shouts went through the country that the Glen had won the county on the night the goat broke loose on Grand Parade. Well, Mary Ellen Warner stood at Woodford Borden's corner, saying, I'll catch a train to Dublin or I'll die. But the goat came up behind her and he gave her such a winder, she hadn't time to bid her friends goodbye. And Mary and Fitzgibbons got her drawers all torn to ribbons, a running to the monster arcade. And it was a sad 
red bereavement when she landed on the pavement on the night the gold broke loose on Grand Parade. Well, on the night the gold broke loose on Grand Parade, here yeah, Mary Ann Fitzgibbons got afraid. She went tearing down the colke and was worse than any polka on the night the gold broke loose on Grand Parade. Well, the people up in Barrica, when they heard the dreadful news, they all swore out in vengeance what they do. So they lined the streets in batches, a hundred saws and hatchets, but when the goat appeared, they all withdrew. Now the goat came through a door, roaring like a whore, followed by Carthage Fire Brigade. And twas at the south Dock Pier, where he landed in the weir, and was never seen again on Grand Parade. Well, on the night the gold broke loose on Grand Parade, all the people of Cock City got afraid, and Condike and Catty Barry took a sidecar out to Blarney. On the night the gold broke loose. On Grand Parade. The next song I'd sing is called uh, the Flip Flop Song. And in uh, traditional music, there are three very famous brothers the Russell brothers from Doolan in County Clare, Michael, Gossie, and Packy. All three of them are in heaven now, and I knew the three of them very well. My first trips were to Doolan in 1970, and I met the, up with the three brothers all playing together, concertina, flute, and whistle, sitting outside the door of O'Connor's pub. Uh, if it wasn't for uh, the Russells, I suppose, Doolan, you could almost say, might never have been heard of. Doolan is now an international uh, tourist uh, attraction that brings people from all over the world in, in quest of traditional music and so on. But of the three brothers, Michael became uh, the most famous and he did a few tours to Germany and the United States, well, New York mostly, and I think maybe Boston and Washington. But Michael always also was a singer and he had a most extraordinary repertoire of songs. Not extraordinary in the extent of the repertoire, but in the content of the songs. Mainly, I suppose, about 10 songs he would have been known for, and they were absolutely astonishing. And I was just 18 at the time, and I was born and reared into the sort of um, rebel ballad tradition into prairie and so on, and when I heard People like Michael Russell, I was taken completely off my feet. I couldn't believe that this kind of song and singing existed in Ireland. I had never heard anything remotely like it. But um, in my recordings, I think maybe, maybe I've recorded seven or eight of Michael's ones. But this is one of them anyway. And for the want of a better name, we'll call it the flip-flop song. There's actually no name to it and most of my course songs, as indeed probably all of the ones I'm going to do for you tonight, nobody would know who wrote them. Some of them are hundreds of years old and that, but uh, this would be one of them, a nonsense song. And Michael was tragically killed in an accident, a car accident, uh, about 30 years ago, I suppose. Anyway, this is the song. <clears throat> Now listen and sing to a very funny thing that happened to McGee. He went one day down to the bay to swim on the briny sea. Now the weather being damp, he said he'd bring a gamp. What a very silly thing to do. He dove down to the bottom and came up to the brim and off to the skies he flew. And he's gone on to glory. He's gone flip. Flop, he's gone on to glory, and he's just wiped off the map. 
They're searching, they're searching near and far. They're searching silly for they can't find Jimmy and they don't know where he are. Now little Billy plans, said in a trance, he'd die for a thousand pounds. The bet was made and Billy was laid underneath the ground. For six long months he laid there in the new grave that they made him. But when they came to dig him up, they didn't know where they let him, and he's gone on to glory. He's gone, flip, flop, he's gone on to glory, and he's just wiped off the map. They're searching, they're searching near and far. They're searching silly for they can't find Billy, and they don't know where he are. Now Michael McGannon heard of a cannon that could fire a thousand ton. So by God says he, I'll go and see that mighty gun. So off he went one fine day. He didn't know the cannon was loaded. He stepped aside to light his pipe and the fecking thing exploded and he's gone on to glory. He's gone flip. Flop, he's gone on to glory, and he's just wiped off the map. They're searching, they're searching near and far. They're searching for a cannon who exploded with a cannon, and they don't know where he are. Uh, the next song I'd sing is called The Boat That First Brought Me Over. And this might well be, it's certainly uh, one of the rarest songs in the whole of the traditional Irish tradition in the English language, let's say. And this was collected by uh, the greatest of all our folklore collectors, the Dublin man by the name of Seamus Ennis. He was from Finglas, and he was, he was the most brilliantly knowledgeable man. And he, he worked with the BBC and collected music indeed all over the, the highlands of Scotland. And in, indeed, I'll be singing a song later where uh, Seamus is responsible for one part of the song. But the one I'm going to do now, he's responsible for all of it. It's just a short little thing. And it was, he collected from this man, a famous singer by the name of Thomas Morn from Drumsna in County Leitrim. And he recorded this in 1954. And uh, Thomas was well known for all comical and nonsense songs, the likes of Brian O'Lean. You might remember Brian O'Lean and his wife and wife's mother. They all went over the bridge together. The bridge tumbled, the bridge fell down and they all tumbled in. We'll go home by water, says Brian O'Lean. And those are the type of songs this man used to do. But um, so here it is, the boat that brought me over. <clears throat> nay, tell me England is a place where everything is great. So big answers I, if that's the case. Sure, that's the place for me. Me father was dying, me mother was crying, St. Patsy, a store, kiss your mother once more. For if you go away across the big sea, you're sure to be drowned and you never will be found. And a codfish and whale will dine on your tail. What a beautiful dish you will make for the fish on the boat that first brought me over. So away I went to London town, strange sights and things to see. All the clothes that I had on was the old fry's coat that covered me. The pipe struck up a merry tune when they lost their darling by. And my mother cried full bitterly, and so did Julie Jai. Well, I wasn't very far out in the sea when first there came thunder and then there came rain. I wished in my heart I was home again. 
end of words for a howl and the ship was a howl and and every blow to the devil we'd go to him up a big wave not be out in the same I was there in despair I say in a prayer when one from behind came was swift in the wind and knocked me right in and the top of some nin and says one for your jump and I'll give you a thump and he up with a stick and he gave me a lick at a cell come by and a master says I take me home to me sisters me father and me brothers and I swear on the book that if I get home I'll never more roam on the boat that first brought me over Okay, and the next the next song I'll sing now is uh, is uh, the Frog's Wedding, and this is the most amazing song. Uh, what way will I put it? It was sung all over uh, the English-speaking world, a little bit like Barbie Allen and things like that, but it found its way back into the Irish tradition and was sung by a few very famous singers. Uh, the most famous would have been Bess Cronin from Cool in West Cork. She had a very large repertoire of Shannon songs, but she also sang a few old comical ones and nonsense songs. This is a feature, by the way, of, of the old traditional singers. While people think they sang nothing but the old Shannon songs and long songs, which they did for the most part all right. But if they, if they got their hands on anything else that they liked, it didn't matter whether it was music hall or comical or nonsense, they would sing it. Now, they didn't have access to much material like this because in the 1800s and the early 1900s, even people who went to America very seldom came home. It was only those who did very well could afford to come home. And if they happened to be from a family of musical background, they might bring back old songs and ballads with them. So the odd song, music hall song and things like crept back into the Irish tradition in that way. So uh, Bess Cronin used to sing a version of this, but what I'm going to do is sing four versions of it all as one song. So one part of this would have been collected by Seamus Ennis up in the Hebrides, I think. One part of it is from the Channel Islands. One ch part is from Bess Cronin in Coulé, And one part from that Thomas Morn I mentioned to you earlier. So it's just four uh, verses all together. But there are four verses, four different versions sung to four different airs and four different choruses, but all as one song. So this is completely unique. The, our own uh, folklore experts, who are amongst the most expert in the world in these matters, have traced this back to 1549, where it was sung by shepherds in the highlands of Scotland. And they know that the song is far older than that, and they estimate that it's probably up to a thousand years old. So it goes without saying that nobody would know who wrote it. So this is it. <clears throat> You'd want to be in the best of your health now for singing this one. <clears throat> Now, now, there was a frog lived in a well with a ring dum bull a dum a me, and a merry mouse lived in a mill with a ring dum bull a dum a me. Kai me nero, kill to care, kai me nero, kai me. Prince and slam a little little bull a ring ting a ling dum bull a dum a me. Now this. Merry frog, he caught a snail with a ring dum bull a dum a kai me. This merry frog, he caught a snail and rode between his horns and tails with a ring dum bull a dum a kai me. Kai me nero, kill to care, kai me nero, kai me. Plinth and slam a little little bull a ring ting a ling dum bull a dum a kai me. Lady Mouse. Sir William, marry me, Kitty alone, Kitty alone, Lady 
mouse, will you marry me? Titty alone and I am. Lady mouse, will you marry me? Ask me, Uncle Rat, says she. To me, cax me, carry dock a needle. Titty alone and I am. Uncle Rat, will you marry Lady mouse? Kitty alone, kitty alone. Uncle Rat, will you marry Lady mouse? Kitty alone and I am. Uncle Rat, will you marry Lady Mouse? Yes, kind sir, and half me house. To me, cax me, carry dock a needle, kitty alone, and I am. Lady Mouse, where will the wedding be? Kitty alone, kitty alone. Lady Mouse, where will the wedding be? Kitty alone, and I am. Lady Mouse, where will the wedding be? Up on the top of a hollow tree. To me, cax me, carry dock a needle, kitty alone, and I am. Well, the first to come was a great big bear. Mm -hmm. The first to come was a great big bear, and he filled up the old armchair. Mm -hmm. The second to come was a great big snake. Mm -hmm. The second to come was a great big snake, and he ate up all the wedding cake. Mm -hmm. Oh, wasn't that a catastrophe? Mm -hmm. Oh, wasn't that a catastrophe to happen in the old oak tree? Mm -hmm. Then, whilst they all at dinner sat, hey ho, hey ho, then whilst they all at dinner sat, in came the kitten and the cat with a roly poly gammon and spinach, hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. Oh, else is he, Mr. Rattle, you give us a song. Hey ho, hey ho, says he, Mr. Rattle, you give us a song. And I hope you won't detain us long with a roly poly gammon and spinach. Hey ho, says Anthony Rowley. Then the cat, she collared the blooming great rat. Hey ho, hey ho, the cat, she collared the blooming great rat. And the kitten, she collared the poor little mouse. With a roly poly gammon and spinach, hey horses, Anthony Rowley. Then this little frog went down the hill with a ring dum bull dum a cry me. This merry frog went down the hill with a ring dum bull dum a cry me. Cry me there, oh, kill to care, oh, cry me there, oh, cry me. Plinch and slam a little little bull a ring ting a ling dum bull dum a cry me. And there he met this little white dog with a ring dum bull dum a Cry me, and there he met this little white dog who swallowed him up with a quack, 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 and a ring dum bull a dum a cry me. Cry me there, oh, kill to care, oh, cry me there, oh, cry me. Plinstrin slammer, little little bull a ring ting a ling dum bull a dum a cry me. There's the frog's wedding. Um, the next one now will go back to a more regular type of traditional song, and I just love this. It's called Nora Daly <coughs> from the parish of Kilmele. And Kilmele is just a little village. You'll be gone through it before you say Jack Robinson. Tiny little village between Ennis and Milltown Malba. And I suppose the reason why I love this, it talks of a the young lad and young lassie uh, hoping to, to get a chance to meet up for a chat and a courtship and so on. And it, this is typical of uh, old traditional, rural traditional Ireland anyway. And I certainly remember the end of this. And this is why I love this so much because it reminds me of those days before 
there were tractors or things like that, and only a very odd person had a car. So ponies and traps and asses and carts were very common at the time. So this is where the little lass and lad met on an ass and cart, and they ended up getting married. So it is, there were quite a few songs like this, but this is my favorite of them. <clears throat> <clears throat> It was down near Milltown, Malbay, not a thousand miles from Galway, when I was young and merry in the breezy hills of Clare, that I spied a colleen comely with winsome ways and homely, and she driving in her donkey cart, and she going to the fair. Well, it was mild and pleasant weather with a bloom of furs and heather. Fill my heart with gladness in the wild and breezy air. And my spirits felt far lighter and my life seemed ten times brighter since I met her in the donkey cart and she going to the fair. Well, says she, I'm Nora Daly from the parish of Kilmele. Me father, he's a farmer and a cautious man in Clare. If he saw you here beside me, I'm afraid that he would chide me. So if you please get down and walk a bit before we reach the fair. Well, I reluctantly obeyed her, for I could not have gainsaid her, her visions of her father bright, with a fierce and angry glare. So before her quickly started, from her I gladly parted, and I treasured her sweet memories till we reached Milltown Malbay. Well, at the four milestone I met her, and within my heart I set her. I searched for tales or tidings of my wanderer everywhere. Well, her heart was in a flutter, for she feared her eggs and butter. They'd be scattered on the roadside, and she going to the fair. Now, after years of so journeying, and my love still brightly burning. I sought for her and married her and settled down in Clare. And I oft times still remind her of that day long left behind her when I met her in the donkey cart and she going to the fair. Now I've told my little story, though Oh, aged now and hoary, it makes me feel quite young again and puts to flight all care. So along with what I've told you, one more secret I'll unfold you, that you never met more loving hearts than those in the county Clare. Um, the last song I'll sing for you now before I go back to have a chat with Stephen is called The Gander. And this is a very traditional song. We're going back to Clare again, actually, now. Uh, anybody even half involved in traditional music and will have heard of the famous <coughs> Willie Clancy's summer school held in Milltown, Malbay every year from 1973. Willie died in f February of 73, and strangely, the first annual commemoration of Willie was the same year that he died, it was in July. So I didn't know about it, so I wasn't there, but I've been at it every year since, I don't know, what a length of time, 47 or eight years, and it's a fantastic festival every year. Willie was a famous character from Milltown, and he was a brilliant piper, 
you know, very much admired by people like Seamus Innes, Kieran McMahon, and all these people. But he also had a few songs. And this one, the gander, he, he very often sang this. It's very, very traditional song in, in its nature. <clears throat> <clears throat> Well, one evening of late as I strayed and rambled through fields, where often I chased with haste and very quick speed. I've been going for a freak where rakes and factions do meet to be drinking strong tea, hot cakes, and things that are sweet. Well, the evening been freezing, and indeed, and I was very cold. It frosted in me heels, me bys and clamps in me toes. I thought it no harm to warm me shanks to the fire, expecting mother and her daughter that they surely would me admire. Well, the teapot came round and in spouts we got stuff very strong. Old mother said, speak or make a verse of a song. Old Bill in the corner, he cursed and he swore in a fright Since his gander was stolen and roasted last Saturday night Now the gander was old, he was noble but sturdy and strong He never grew cold, although he lived very long His feet and his legs were as yellow as the gold that do shine and he his beak, it would hold an inch board in a very short time. Well, I've travelled Killarney, Kilgarvan, Cantork, and Mill Street, and around by Cork Harbour, Hawken in turkeys and geese, and in all of my travels and rambles, I never did meet with the likes of Bill's Gander for beauty and very fine breed. Well, the girls all came for game and looking for breed When they heard of the name and fame of Bill and his geese They measured the scandal's fine legs with a carpenter's rule And they never would part him when they saw the fine length of his wings and now I'm going back to Stephen to have a chat. That's the last song. Well, there we go, Mr. Dick Hogan. It's been about, uh, I think I met Dick first about 18 years ago or so. Um, I first met him over in uh, Lanzarote, of all places. Uh, I used to play with a band over there. Um, we were doing a month stint, and uh, Dick and the, the whole O'Shea's uh, merchant crowd uh, arrived in, and Dick was, uh, someone sent up Dick's name to get up and sing a song with us, so he did. How are you, Dick? Pleasure to be here. How are you doing? All right. <laughs> Thanks for coming along. Some yeah. interesting songs. Have I turned this up? Yeah, you're on, yeah? Yeah. Tell me about the songs, Dick. One of them, a thousand years old, with, with four, different, right. four different melodies. How does that survive a thousand well, years? Well, <coughs> it, it being a nonsense song, and I having access to the four versions, there was a, a famous old LP made, oh, in the 60s, called Songs, it was an English traveler LP, anyway, and it was an, ex, an astonishing LP and much of the stuff on it was collected by Seamus Ennis, but you couldn't, uh, you couldn't decipher the, the words hardly, because they had their own unique style of singing. But luckily, whoever produced it, well, the BBC were fantastic, and they had the words of all the songs, so you could learn the, the words. And uh, Seamus Ennis being the great man that he was, he included four uh, versions of the song on the LP. So you heard these four entirely different versions of it. It's all the same song, but completely different uh, singing and uh, tunes to the songs. Imagine the difference between the Channel Islands and Leitrim and the Hebrides, and <laughs> you know. So I, I, I was fascinated by this song, and I said, God, I have the, 
I had the, the four airs. And why not slap the whole lot of it together and have a go? Now, it is a bit of a vocal challenge, all right, you know, changing from one air into the other sort of seamlessly, you know. But I practiced it anyway, and uh, that's the, the end That product. comes across great. Did you so there's four different verses of that yeah. song, and you decided to yeah. sing the four verses, yeah. obviously, differently yeah. yourself yeah. to put yeah. them together. That's what yeah. you always slap together. That's obviously. my yeah. only bit of creativity ever. <laughs> in the, I, well, I never wrote a song, you know what I mean? But that's what that's, I did that with that song. So Seamus right. Adoud is where you got that particular song from? No, or, or, uh, no that song. Or was on an old LP, an old, on an old BBC LP. LP, yeah. I was just it was called Songs of, Songs of Travellers and Other Marvels, Okay. I think was the title of the, the LP. I don't think I actually heard it before oh, as well. Very, it would be one of the original yeah. back in the 60s, you know. Tell us about the other songs as well. Huh? Tell us about the other songs. Where did you, where did you discover them from? I actually studied, I studied for a while uh, Irish traveller music and, and English folk songs and, and travel music, so I'm interested to know where you're, you're getting your songs from. So uh, I didn't know you sang th oh, those songs. Oh yeah, well, <laughs> sort of. I always loved song. We were born and reared in a, a house of song. My father was a good singer and um, again, being from to Prairie, it was mostly rebel ballads, and indeed that was the way all over the country, you know, old nationalistic ballads like the Bays of Wexford and Who Fears to Speak of 98. Those were the songs everybody heard on Radio Ern in those years. And you heard uh, Delia Murphy, Joe Lynch, John McCormack, Brendan O'Dowda, and then, toward the end of the 50s, with the arrival of Buddy Holly, and then the Beatles, and as the fellas says, you all know, the rest after a myriad of music and pop music uh, began to appear on Radio Air uh, to the detriment of all the others. They literally vanished off the airwaves almost overnight. And um, so, from the early 60s onwards, you virtually never heard John McCormack or Delia Murphy. Oh, no, not time, of course, you will. Yeah. But they were the staple diet of the time. That's all you heard. And like programs like the Walton's programs and Mitch's Sound Cream, these sponsored programs. And they had all these great old songs. Uh, and Seamus the Clandaloon was another one. He was actually the first director of what was. Radio Air, which was called 2RN that time, and used to broadcast from the GPO wow. from 1926, I think it was. But he was a regular singer on it himself as well. And he, his wife was uh, Maura Nianagon, and they were regular visitors to the Ring in County Waterford, which had a most wonderful, rich tradition of Shannos and most beautiful Irish you ever heard, but uh, an amazing uh, culture of Shannos songs like the old Schlievenamon, Oscoelga, and Band of Atlanta, and Cock Hemini, and these truly fantastic songs. Um, so that was, would have been the influence of. Uh, Seamus the Clandalone's influence would have been very strong, you know. Yeah. And, the, and of course, uh, what was his name? Leo Maguire, the Waltons, was involved as well. So you can imagine it was all that kind of stuff you heard. Now, Sean, uh, Sean Tracy and Dan Breen were neighbours of ours, of course, in Tipperary. So it was very staunchly a Republican area. And then, as well as that, you went to the Christian Brothers School. That was the only primary school and secondary school in Tipperary. And the Christian Brothers had their own songbook. I think it was called Glorna Heron or something. It had a green book. It was their own publication. And uh, part of their curriculum was that they taught all the pupils the songs. Now, they didn't teach you how to sing or anything like yeah. that, but you, you were expected to learn the songs, just like poetry or anything else, and have them off, you know. So all those songs, like Wrap the Green Flag Around Me, Buys and Who Fears, oh, yeah. like, there were dozens and dozens of songs like that, but you were expected to learn them. So then when I went to Dublin, 
Of course, I was, I was, I was, I had all sorts of other music and things. I tell you what we'll do, Dick. Yeah. Do you mind? I want to get stuck in and find out a lot about yourself as well. And yeah. before we go to that, you're going to sing a few more songs yes. and then come back to me and then we'll, we'll get stuck in. So we'll hear, hear a few more songs from you now, if that's all right. And then we'll go get stuck into the, the real part of the interview, if that's yeah. all right with you. Okay. So just put the mic down on, on, the, mean, on the chair yeah. there for you. You make your way to the stage and we'll hear more of Dick Hogan. And I'm going to say hello to a few people who are tuning in. Uh, we've got Sarah Boland, who is a regular listener, tuning in uh, uh, all the time. Uh, we've got Anne McCurr, uh, Chris, Christina Gassick Tracy. There's all sorts of conversation going on on Noel Boland's page, which we were looking at earlier as well so uh, we'll, we'll get on to know later when we have him on stage um, and I'm going to hand you back over we're going to have Dick Hogan and I've no idea actually I should have some idea I should ha I have them written down here of the songs that he's going to do very interesting songs great to hear him he's the first traditional Irish singer that we really had who's singing unaccompanied so it's definitely different tonight so I'm going to hand you back over to Dick and are you ready to go again Dick he's getting ready there give us a second we, we get him ready and over to Dick we go Okay, the next song is called, again I think for the want of a better name, we'll call it The Devil He Came to Our Town One Day. Now this is one of the ones that uh, appeared on that album uh, of the BBC that I spoke about there a few minutes ago. And uh, again, this one found its way back into the Irish tradition. And as I was saying that people uh, who were, for the most part, immersed in the serious songs and all the rest. But they were always delighted to sing nonsense songs, humorous songs and comical songs as well, if they got their hands on them, for light relief and just for variety and so on. And uh, they would be, uh, people used to love to hear those, because everybody knew the other ones and there was no great novelty in them as such. Anyway. Well, well, there once was a man lived in our town, and to my sweet total laddie, oh, he married a girl and she wasn't the best. With me like fall, fall the diddle daddy, ah, with me like fall da, fall the diddle da, like fall, fall the diddle daddy, oh. Well, she had six cows, six of the best, and to my sweet total laddie, oh, she laid back in the bed till the six went dry. With me like fall, fall the diddle daddy, ah, with me like fall da, fall the diddle da, like fall, fall the diddle daddy, oh. Well, she churned the milk in the old man's boots, and to my sweet total laddie, oh, she made the butter with the old pot hooks, with me like fall, fall the diddle daddy, ah, uh, with me like fall da, fall the diddle da, like fall, fall the diddle daddy, oh. Then she put the butter on the shelf, and to my sweet total laddie, oh, it never got a turn till it turned itself. With me like fall, fall the diddle daddy. Ah, with me like fall da, fall the diddle da. Like fall, fall the diddle daddy, oh. Well, it first turned green and it then turned grey. And to my sweet total laddie, oh. It next grew legs and it walked away. With me like fall, fall the diddle daddy. Ah, with me like fall. Fall da, fall the diddle da, right fall, fall the diddle da di then she went into town, her eggs for to sell, and to my sweet total laddie, oh, she sucked the yolks and she sold the shells with me, like fall, fall the diddle laddie, ah, with me, like fall da, fall the diddle da, like fall, fall the diddle daddy, oh. Then the devil he came to our town one day, and to my sweet total laddie, he swept her body and her bones clean away. With me like fall, fall the diddle daddy. Ah, with me like fall da, fall the diddle da. Like fall, fall the diddle daddy. Oh. 
But come here, I was saying to you, do, we, want to, we want to find a bit more about yourself. You were mentioning about the, the Christian Brothers and, and getting the songbook. That's, what, that's where we kind of left off. Oh, yeah, microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. So tell us a little bit about that. So uh, that was the early influence. And as I say, then I came to Dublin at 17 um, to train as a technician in the department of what was known as the Department of Post and Telegraphs at the time as a communications technician. So uh, the first, my first assignment was to Ship Street Telephone Exchange, would you believe, which was in Dublin Castle. And this was the first fully automatic exchange to be built in Europe, apparently. And I think it was probably because it was in the headquarters of the British establishment, Dublin Castle. You know, so they had a telephone exchange actually in Dublin Castle. It was called Ship Street, which is the street running along by the side of it. But as it happens, that's where I was. And uh, Brendan O'Dowder's brother, Frank, happened to be the foreman there. And he used to hear me singing in amongst the racks of equipment. Part of your training was you'd be in amongst all the equipment, testing and doing routine testing, etc. every day, you know. And uh, Brendan used to hear me singing away to myself, and he was, he often heard me singing Percy French songs amongst other things, you know. So he cocked his ear and he called me over one day, and he said, Dick, I heard you singing. Yeah. So he called me in and he said, uh, he said, did you know uh, Brendan O'Dowd was, is a brother of mine? Oh, I said, I didn't. I was amazed to hear this. And he said, There's, uh, uh, he has a fan club called the Brendan O'Dowd Circle. And he said, we're going to Belfast, well, I don't know what, a couple of weeks' time or something, and we're going on a trip up to Belfast. He said, would you like to come? And we'll meet Brendan and the bus and some of the fan club. I said, I'd love that. So we went up anyway, and we had a great time on the bus. There wasn't that many, maybe 20 on the bus or something like that. Yeah. So that's where I met Brendan. He was a very glamorous character, fine looking cut of a man with a big head of black curly hair and loads of rings on rings on every finger and he was a debonair dashing sort of character, you know. Okay. And he he the, he was singing in the Grove Theatre and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And then afterwards in he came he did a gig in the Balrothery Inn. It's in North County Dublin. And I have a feeling that could have been the last gig he did in Ireland. He, he didn't come back to Ireland, I'd say, after the mid-1970s or so. You see, he, the, his popularity for his kind of stuff had basically disappeared. There wouldn't have been much of a market for it. And <clears throat> But he went on to become very successful. He lived down in the south of England. I think he had seven sons. One of them was a famous footballer in England, and the young O'Dowder lad that's with the Irish international team at the moment, he's, uh, I think, a nephew of Brendan. Brendan died about 2004, uh, yeah, 2004 or five. And um, his brother, Frank, lived in Tala, actually, near where, we, where okay. we are now, and he's passed away since, too. But um, so one of, one of definitely one of your biggest inspirations, anyway. I, I'm guessing. Well, he he yes, I suppose. You see, everybody knew Percy French in Ireland that time. Yeah. He was very popular because he 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 sang, he had comical, humorous songs. But in actual fact, they were extremely accurate social history songs like Mac Breen's Heifer from Colour. Bally Poreen, uh, oh God, there's loads of them. There's uh, Mix Hotel and Eileen Ogue and all these. But they're actually stories of actual rural life. Percy never wrote about urban life at all. What's the history behind Eileen Ogue? Do you know that I actually recorded that song myself? Did you? Uh, Eileen Ogue, off the top of my head now, I don't know. There's other ones yeah, I, I could tell you the whole story of it. Uh, yeah, so there, I always felt that Percy's songs were far more important than people in the strictly traditional uh, scene uh, acknowledged. 
And a lot of the reason for this was that Percy was sung always with music, and indeed, Brendan O'Dowder, he had the, the, the Philip Green Orchestra and all that. So the public never really heard Percy French outside of that sort of semi-classical sort of setting. Yeah. So that's how, and then uh, Percy being of landed gentry stock, he would have been kind of frowned on by the, the strong uh, traditional I know what you mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. scene, you know. But that was largely through ignorance. I don't mean that in a harsh sense, but ignorance as in lack of knowledge yeah. or lack of understanding. Percy was actually more Irish than most Irish people. And there's no doubt about that. Everything about him indicates that. And he wrote a few songs that demonstrate, like what one of the most let's hear let's awake, which has music to it, but nobody ever sang it or recorded it. But that really demonstrates a very intimate knowledge of Irish tradition. And he he talks of you would be in no doubt whatsoever about the difference between Ireland and England. Yeah. But Percy was very comfortable in aristocratic circles and indeed played for royalty on a number of occasions, but Percy didn't care about that. This would have been in furtherance of his and career, have, of have course. You, have you recorded some of Percy's I have, yeah. I made a, a CD, I think there's 20, 19 or 20 songs of Percy on the CD. Can I ask you about um, your? Before, before, can I actually ask you about your first album, the the Wonders of the World, which, yeah. which displays your character as well? I was saying in the yeah. introduction, like, you know, yeah. tell us how it's displaying your character, or what's what's going on there. Um, is it just the types of songs that you chose and the stories about them, or, or what songs are on yes. that album? Yes, and the title of the album was very uh, well chosen. I chose the title called "The Wonders of the World" to demonstrate uh, uh, the fascination of the world and also the fascination of, what way will I put it, nonsense, nonsense and that kind of thing, you know, yeah. that, makes, uh, that makes nonsense of mundanity and all this kind of thing. And I, I always sort of did that, you know, because... The nonsense songs, you mean, like, yeah. Well, yes, yeah. Like, like life is very serious and so on. So I always made a point of Ah, why not lighten it a bit at times and sing comical song? Percy French had this ability. He was able to put this little dollop of humor into everything, whereas he was actually being extremely accurate, but he was careful not to overemphasize it because some people might be a little bit so offended, you offended, know, yeah, and yeah. this was often said of him that, that Percy was laughing at the people. Oh, which really? couldn't possibly be further from the truth. <laughs> well, he was laughing with them and he loved the ordinary of people. Yeah. But getting back to uh, that he was very comfortable with royalty, he, all of this was in Percy's interest because he had a young family. He had four young kids and uh, to make a living and he had no other means of a living and he had to pay for expensive accommodation in London when he emigrated there in 1900. He died in 1920. Anyway, he went on to become very successful, like Brendan O'Dowda, he went on to become very successful in spite of himself because he was very bohemian in his ways and had no interest in amassing wealth or that and would be very untidy in his dress. And he often lost well-paid engagements because of this, right. seriously lost. And then he, he took up partnership with a brilliant uh, pianist, a Dr. Houston Collison, who was a brilliant pianist and singer uh, in 1891, I think it was. And that collaboration lasted until Percy's death. And this Dr. Collison was very good at the financial end of things and the organizing of the gigs and all that. And he would play the piano with Percy on some of the more important uh, performances, especially when they toured in America and France and a few places like that. Uh, he was also a very good humored little man. There were two small little men. Percy was only five foot four oh. and Collison was only five foot two. And they were very similar in mentality. 
So they suited one another very well. And Collison would have written most of the music to his later songs. And his later songs, as it happens, are actually his greatest songs. And they happen to be the ones that the broad public know least about. Because Brendan O'Dowd didn't make his second LP until the early 1970s, by which time he had basically disappeared off the airwaves. And the broad general public never heard, actually, the later stuff that Brendan O'Dowd did which is many of the songs are much better than some of the ones people heard earlier because in the meantime brendan had made a major study of percy french and began to cop on to how brilliant he was he was the only songwriter indeed of nearly all of the 20th century who wrote like he did from the time he died Right up until the mid-1970s, nobody else in Ireland wrote humorous or comical songs at all until people like Tim Lyons, Fintan Valley, and I know all these guys in the mid-1970s began to write brilliant sort of uh, comical songs of contemporary events like... Well, Dick, you're, you're, you're keeping the tradition going, yeah. which is 100%, which is brilliant, like, you know, Tell me a little bit about yourself, like the, 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 the playing in Australia, the, the Australian tour is over 70,000 people. I've heard you on the radio, I've heard you on RTE, I've heard you on BBC, like I've heard, you have a very distinctive voice. Um, give us a little, a little bit more about yourself as well, like, you know, because it's great that you're keeping the tradition going uh, from songs that are so old. Yeah, okay, well, yeah, I, I, I'll start by saying that uh, the singing was one thing, but then I became exposed to uh, sessions. And yeah. because I was somebody who sang songs and the Department of Force and Telegraphs was such a huge organization, there was 21,000 people working in the department at that time. It was as big as all the other 14 governments, departments put together, if you take the army and the Gardaí out of it who are not, strictly speaking, civil servants, but the actual civil service part of the government, the PNT was as big as all of the others put together because the engineering branch was involved as well as the post office and then, of course, all of the civil service part of it. Anyway, there was all the sessions. Everyone that was 21 or getting married or getting engaged or anything, every cockfight, you would be invited to it. <laughs> So we were at parties, like non-stop, anybody who could play guitar or sing a song. There was no money involved or anything yeah. like that. So of course we all, we, <laughs> we all nearly became alcoholics because, because of it. But, um, but then uh, some of the guys in the PNT were traditional musicians like John Regan and Jim Nolan. They were yeah. very, very good accordion players. So they'd, heard me, they'd have heard me sing, and so they began to invite me on to traditional sessions. Yeah. And believe it or not, the first great traditional session I was at was only yards from this venue. Oh, yeah? It was in Delaney's in Fairhouse. Just across the road. Just across yeah. the road. Yeah. And it was with Sean Garvey, who was a famous singer. He was from Cahar Sabine in County Kerry, a fantastic singer banjo player, guitar player, and a Seamus O'Rahilly, and there was another guy, I can't think of, been a fiddle player, and I, I was asked out to that, and I went out and sang it for a song. Well, I was absolutely over the moon to hear this traditional music. These were good musicians. Yeah. And this is my first real traditional session in Dublin. Okay. So I was completely taken to the fair with this, and I immediately went on down to Doolan. What, as what, I what, what year are you kind of talking about? The oh, God. Well, I went to Doolan in 1970, as I said to you. So it could have been that year as okay, well, you okay, know. Yeah. Um, I wasn't even born. Huh? <laughs> I wasn't even born. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but I saw a tradition. I didn't put any heed in the singing at all. I just yeah. sang, if you know what I mean, the same as you ate your breakfast or anything. I never put any heed in it. To us, it was something we did. But now, this new thing, music, oh, I just couldn't get over it. So I went like a lunatic all over Ireland for music. And because I was an unaccompanied singer, 
I think everybody got to know you. Sang Karen by default. Mm -hmm. And especially if you were someone who sang songs that were a bit different, humorous or comical, because the musicians were, you know, they had heard all the other songs that everybody sings. So somebody that sang, sang ones that were different and they'd cock their ear and they used to love this. So I'd be asked everywhere and asked to sing everywhere I went. And, but, so that I was at every flair, festival, cockfight you could dream of it. And I just loved every second of it. But... You collected so many songs with the... With the I remember I was in O'Shea's Merchant and I heard of the, the album that you're releasing with over... Was it over 300 songs on, on like 200 in the 200, collection, Sorry, yeah, 200 songs, yeah. which I couldn't believe that, which is something yeah. else, like, you know? Yeah. How did you go about even recording 200 songs? It was an enormous... Where did you begin and when did you know you were going to well, end? Well, I'll tell you, I'll <laughs> tell you now how it happened. Um, going to sessions and things around the country, things like the Willie Clancy's summer school and things like that, where you would have the cream of musicians in Ireland would they come to things like that, and the All Ireland Flair. And I began to notice in my later years, more and more people saying to me, Dick, um, where did you hear that song? And I haven't ever heard that before. And why don't you record this? And why don't you record that? And again, I didn't put any heed in it at all. I had made my first CDR right in 1997, which was a long time ago, you know. Yeah. That took three years to make. That. CD. It was a very complex right. CD. But anyway, more and more people were saying it to me, why don't you hear And after a while, the penny began to drop that there, there's something in this, there must be right. And it also dawned on me that I wasn't hearing anybody else at it either. Yeah. So I said, God, I better do this because they'll be dead. The songs will never be heard again. Now, I knew there was never going to be any money. This was going to cost me far more than I'd ever make out of it, and that turned out well, well, to, to be the, the case, anyway. I can assure you. <laughs> but, um, so, um, yeah, a character, Ron Kavanagh, he's a great, brilliant musician. He was quite famous in England, and he was from Fermi and Cork. He would have been better known in the English folk scene than he was in the Irish scene but an extremely knowledgeable man on world music, but also on traditional Irish music. And he encouraged me, and he said, Dick, you should, you should definitely do this. He says, I'll start the ball rolling, you and all the rest. So we went to Ennis, to a, it was the Ennis Tide Festival. I, no, it was a Flan Noah in Ennis, the month of May. I don't know what year it was, but anyway. <coughs> we went down, and Ron had this little place arranged, and we sat in, and he said, Dick, he said, you sing best, he said, when, when you're in a pub scene, which were pint, and amongst people that you know, and you're enjoying the music. That, that's when you sing best, he said, with no microphones or formality. And I said, yeah, that's true enough, all right. So we set about it anyway, so I sang maybe 10 or 12 songs or something, and that was the beginning of it. Um, I went on, yes, I know what happened. I said, right, I think Ron is right. I'll go off around the country, and everywhere I go, I'll sing songs in the sessions, and I'll have my own little Sony mini disc recorder. They get yeah. very high, very good quality recordings, and I'll put the mic down, and I'll, I'll say to the people, all right, that look, I'm recording this so if we can have a little bit of quiet, but you were wasting your time, you know. The whole thing was a disaster. I probably gave two or three years doing that. And there was scarcely one song that would be acceptable between racket and knives and power on and tilts clanging and glasses breaking and everything else. Oh. So I abandoned that idea. And then I said, right, I'll go to a studio. So I went to a studio out in Souls. What was his name? Is it Edie or uh, he's a very well-known guy anyway. He's a very good pianist. And he has a studio out there in Souls. And I said I'd bring a few musicians out. So I got Noreen O'Donnell, who was a brilliant pianist and harpist. And um, we started, yes, I made a full CD out there, mostly little children's songs, Oscarelga in Irish. And it turned out very good. But 
it turned out very expensive. It cost about three grand just to do that, and yeah. I had to pay this out of my own pocket. So I knew that I had enough material, certainly for 15 CDs or so, if I was going to continue on with this project, that I couldn't afford it. You'd want the Bank of Monte Carlo behind you, you know. Mm -hmm. So I said, the only answer to this is to set up my own little studio. So of course I knew plenty of people who knew about microphones and mixers and yeah, didn't know it what. Together. So I got John Blake over. John is a brilliant sound engineer. I don't know if you've come across him. And I heard of John and he came over. So all I had was a little mixer and I had a Sony uh, mini disc recorder and a really good microphone. And of course I had the computer and all that. And Sony produced a mini disc recorder, it was the last version of it they ever made, and there were only a few of them ever made. This was an expensive piece of gear, right. but this particular recorder, recorder had a feature on it called PCM. Now, PCM would have meant yeah, pulse yeah. code modulation in telecommunication, but this is different. And it's, this is, Sony claimed that it was direct CD quality straight off, and the sound engineer agreed. He said, it is. So I was able to record onto this, and I had CD studio quality straight away. Brilliant. So I went on then, and the next thing was, how will I <laughs> arrange all this? So I wrote the titles of all the songs out, and I said, I'll, the original box set was 20 CDs. And I said, each CD will have the title of what we call in, in, in traditional circles a big song. Yeah. Or massive big songs, like The Frog's Wedding, now there was one of them. That would have been the title of one. The Rich Man and the Poor Man would have been the title of another. Then things like Patrick Sheehan and My Beauty Spotling Lee. These are all the massive big traditional ballads. So Dick, ju just, I have to cut it a little bit short, just because yeah. Noel is waiting, and yeah. I'm just out of inform that his wife and kids are just waiting, because I want to hear him play as yeah. well, because we're going past the hour. Yeah. So where can people get a hold of this, this, this album for you? Oh, it's, um, well, the box set and the book are all on the internet. They're not in the shops or any kind of yeah. bothered with it. But um, I have a website, it's www.tradirishsongs.com. But you don't need to know the web address, just Google any browser, just Dick Hogan. Google Dick Hogan. And around about the fifth line down, you'll see Dick Hogan, biography of. And then you go into that, and there's several tabs you can click on. But you'll find there's 26 CDs listed down along. They're all color coded into different categories. So you would have, let's say, songs of Tipperary is in blue and gold, the colors of Tip. Songs of um, love songs, old traditional love songs would be in pink. Yeah. The nationalistic songs are in green. So the people could learn uh, which one they'd go for first. Because in the box, all the, every CD has its own sleeve and different sleeve notes. And they're all colored. It was an enormous job. It took almost 10 years to complete altogether between the internet aspect of it and then uh, I'm, I'm, re I'm raging. You, you, you said you forgot today to do it. We might get Toby after maybe to stick up a picture of it so people can see it and see where what? to get it. I'm raging. You said you forgot to bring the, the, the CDs with you first oh, yeah. just to show on the stage. But yes. we'll maybe get Toby after just to maybe stick up a picture of it and, and so on that the people screen, can see yes. it and where to get it. Dick, yeah. I really appreciate you coming along. Thank you very, very much. Um, and I'll, you're going to come back on to us at the end and we're going to do a song together with Noel. We're going to have right. Noel okay. Ball on that.